Welcome everybody to the Coinbase Speaker Series. We've got a great guest today, Ryan Selkis. He is one of crypto's most prominent voices going back to the very earliest days of crypto. And today he is the co-founder and CEO of Masari, a crypto research and analytics company. Previously, he was the managing director at Coindesk, a publication that we all read a lot in the office. And he was also the first employee at a crypto VC firm, Digital Currency Group, DCG, which many of you know. He's been writing about and investing in crypto for nearly a decade. He just published a really impressive annual report uh, that Masari puts out. It's 165 pages. It takes him about 250 hours a year to put it all together. Um, it's an incredible read that covers a wide range of topics happening in crypto, everything from what's coming up in 2022 to um, the, the collapse of trust in institutions. And we're going to talk about many of those topics in the report today. So, uh, Ryan, thank you so much for being here, first of all. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's good to, good to do this. The first time I remember your name really blew up in the crypto space, got really popular, was the post you put out. You used to be pseudonymous, it sounds like, before it was cool mm -hmm. to be pseudonymous. You were you were went on the handle 2-Bit Idiot, right? And you you put out this post about Mt. Gox and the coming collapse, and then that post went viral. And I remember that was the first time I you'd really gotten on my radar as well. So um, anyway, what, what was what was going on for you in the early days like that? What, how did you decide to start posting pseudonymously? So I started my career in VC, uh, decided pretty quickly I wanted to be on the other side of the table and uh, started a company at, uh, when I was 25 focused on charitable payments. That required IRS approval for a pretty critical component of the business. And um, I decided to defer an offer to business school to work on it, um, but ultimately shuttered that business in October. So I deferred for a year and I had 10 months on my hand and it happened to be early um, uh, in that 2013 run up, uh, the, the fall 2013. So um, I had to make a decision. What am I going to do A with the next 10 months and then B, what am I going to do with this asset just that just went up six times uh, in, in a matter of weeks that I kind of locked into because uh, I bought a little bit actually on Coinbase just to um, kind of uh, with with my initial buy because I was starting to learn a little bit more about Bitcoin. And, um, you know, I went down the proverbial rabbit hole over a long weekend and realized there wasn't really anyone writing about uh, Bitcoin full time. Um, started a newsletter, started, you know, just opining on the Reddit forums. That's how we got you know, connected pseudonymously. And then um, at the time, there was probably only a couple hundred people that were either funded or actively investing or, you know, kind of what you would consider full time in the space. And, and many of them were subscribers. So I ended up getting my hands on the Mt. Gox document that um, exposed what they were trying to uh, salvage in, in terms of the, the you know, $700 million hack or, or whatever the ultimate damage was. Um, so uh, I started writing just you know kind of out of necessity because um, I had 10 months on my hand and I didn't want to get another full-time job and decided it, I was excited enough about Bitcoin to take a chance and maybe pass on, uh, on business school period. Sure enough, that's what happened. I joined DCG later that year, um, helped kind of build the core team, uh, was running seed investing at, at, at DCG for the early days. We closed around in 2015. And then when we acquired Coindesk, I flipped back over to the operating side. So um, in uh, some way, shape or form, I've been touching information products for close to a decade with respect to crypto uh, from a few different seats at the same table. Well, you've been such an important voice in the crypto community. It's been awesome to see it develop over the years. And there was this recent example back in August, I guess you put out this iconic tweet uh, which went viral and you said, I'm sick of feeling like we have to apologize for our early stage and walk on eggshells around politicians and regulators. We built a $2 trillion financial market from scratch in less than a decade with absolutely no institutional help and active encumbrances from government. You go on in the, in the, in the tweet, but I mean, this really struck a chord with the community. I think it felt like we were uh, working so hard behind the scenes to try to create a better world here. And um, it, you know, it'd be nice once in a while. It's nice for someone to say thank you. But even if you if you can't say thank you, it's better to like at least don't do no harm. Right. And it always felt mm -hmm. like there were people actively pushing back along the way about creating the creation of this new financial system. I mean, what what it sounds like that that tweet just came to you in a moment uh, of inspiration. It wasn't like deliver, you know, some massive thought out thing. But what what was going through your head at that time when you, when you put out that message? Well, I think it's probably similar to a lot of other folks, particularly those that have been around for a while, right? Um, you know, you and and the early folks at Coinbase, I mean, have, have been working on regulated financial products and financial services and, and you know, adding credibility to this industry for a long time. You know, there are dozens of others that are kind of in, in, in our shoes. And, you know, from my uh, standpoint, 
Masari was born really as a bit of a policy response itself. If you think about our some of our core information products, we're trying to reverse engineer what SEC disclosures would look like, or, or what like a good solid like set of information uh, reporting standards would look like for community governed assets, and um, and some of the language coming out of DC, particularly around the uh, the broker language and and yeah you know, the infrastructure bill and the debate of uh, over that particular provision. Um, you, at some point, you just <laughs> throw up your arms and, and you're frustrated getting slapped around by misinformed or, or you know, downright dishonest folks in, in D.C. just because it fits their political purposes. So I think um, uh, that frustration bubbled over for a lot of us. And I'm glad it did, because I, I think in the never let a crisis go to waste mindset, uh, August was a, was a pretty good rallying cry. We knew that we were going to have to get active uh, at some point, and it wasn't just going to be a straight shot to like cleanly integrating into the financial system. And, and you know, there was basically going to be no roadblocks put up by regulators or, or, or the state long term. Um, so it's not so much that this broker language got passed um, and, and we ultimately lost the battle. I, I think as a catalyzing event, it was um, much more powerful long term for us uh, as a community, and 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 for this as a, a tech movement. Um, I think uh, the, the virality of that particular thread uh, wasn't so much a, a moment of genius, so much as the, the I think the right moment in time that, that captured where people's heads were collectively. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Looking back on this year, twenty twenty one, I mean, it, it did have this this big moment where I think the whole crypto industry realized. Hey, we need to go engage more thoughtfully. It was we we were sort of used to being ignored and and um, just you know people thought oh it's a toy let's stick to ignore it or whatever and suddenly it was like boom it was the biggest thing on everyone's radar in D.C. and so you know we all I think collectively realized it's now time to go make a really even bigger concerted effort to go be an educational resource and and close the mm -hmm. gap on some of these massive um, misunderstandings which are always shocking when you when you go over there um, you know there's so many efforts going on in for government relations now in the crypto space. Uh, Blockchain Association has been great. Coin Center has been great. Jerry Brito has kind of been a secret weapon there for many years behind the scenes. Um, the Crypto Council for Innovation is a new group that you know we're helping fund with a number of others. What, what would you say the crypto industry should be doing or needs to be doing, I mean, um, in this regard to engage with the government even more? And we'll get to Web3 stuff. I just want to touch a little bit on the, the, the macro side. Um. I think everyone's moving as fast as they possibly can uh, in, in a lot of respects. It is important that there's follow through and that these uh, industry groups come together and, and people rally around them. And, and we have a somewhat united message um, in, uh, in in some of these conversations. And, and the reason I say that um, it's a, it's an especially critical you know couple of quarters. Um, and it's the reason I've been so outspoken on some of these issues, because I, I do think these next couple of quarters are, are critical in the sense that um, we have a bull market <laughs> in our sales right now. Um, and we've got a lot of enthusiasm. You know, first it was, it was DeFi summer and then all the layer ones rallied and then NFTs rallied. And, and you know, it's it's just been a the, the rotating, you know, pop all the money trade um, where a lot of people have done very well. They've gotten excited. There's a lot of applications that people are picking up on. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, we're getting close to, if not, a, you know, already crossing the chasm kind of early on, uh, especially with younger investors. If we can't capitalize on that now, now that we have regulator and policymakers attention, then when the market does turn the other direction, they're going to be able to use that against us. Right. Um, a lot of people got hurt. There weren't adequate disclosures there weren't adequate consumer protections. So the time to mobilize, um, you know, get the funding and, and get, kind of get these policy teams in place, both within companies and then at these trade organizations and, and, and advocacy groups, I think is now. And, and we have to capitalize on that. Um, I think what Andreessen uh, has done is amazing. Um, if you want to go fast, go alone. And we need someone going fast right now while the rest of the industry tries to you know come to come together and and uh have the, the broader alignment conversations between CCI and Blockchain Association and, and Coin Center and, and the like. Um, I do think um, one of the things that is missing, and I've spoken about this um, more generally, but uh, I do think we're going to need an individual member organization that um, is much more grassroots in its approach and isn't just you know a, an agent of the incumbent 
crypto institutions, right? Um, I think that's very important and that's probably where the rubber meets the road from regulation, but I, I think we wanna make sure we continue to kind of call out the um, the individual and like self-sovereign element. And that's why you know I was so happy to see interoperability as a prong of the Coinbase proposal um, when it came out. I, I, I think uh, that is gonna go a long way towards um, giving people confidence that this is a, a good faith effort um, to engage with policymakers and not just an instance of, you know, the the new gods replacing the old gods and and uh, and you know having the, the the set of regulatory capture that we're kind of used to in every other emerging industry. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah, I think um, there's definitely a lot of different voices coming out. You know, Coinbase came out with a proposal, and FTX came out with one, and Dreesen has has come out with some. And I think there are a lot of voices, but they're all in generally moving in the same direction. And so, mm -hmm. um, you know. I think the more efforts, the better here. Hopefully, I agree with you about the grassroots movement too. I'd love to see an organization like CCI or, or any of these other ones kind of help organize the crypto community, all the you know tens of millions of Americans and, and people outside of the US as well who have crypto and they're voters, right? Because ultimately um, the regulators are accountable to the pol elected politicians, elected politicians are accountable to the people in democracy. And so the more you know product features that we can have, for instance, to help direct individual crypto holders in this district or in this zip code and say, hey, you know, go donate, go, you know, here's a some an, an A or an F grade on the local politicians and get, you know, help them get the movements going. That's been successful more so than like a company going and lobbying. I think it's more powerful to have their constituents, their voters going out. And I, I also think it's, you know, of course, we've taken sort of an apolitical stance at Coinbase, except in regard to our mission. And so our mission is, of course, advocating crypto and economic freedom in the world. Um, and I've been happy to see that, you know, crypto is actually a pretty bipartisan issue in DC. There are, there are people on the left and right who don't like it. There's some people on the left and right who do like it. And there's a bunch in the middle who just don't know yet. They haven't made up their mind. And so, um, mm -hmm. being that educational resource, I think, and, and having our, the constituents in all these districts who own crypto and are benefiting from it. I mean, that's, I think that's ultimately how crypto wins is we just get more and more people using it and benefiting from it with all these new apps coming out and DeFi and NFTs and DAOs and everything. And so, um, there, that's ultimately going to be the best defense I think we have for any sort of incumbent or person who might want to harm crypto for their own purposes. I, so. I think that's 100% accurate. And, um, I actually think where, you know, given this administration's approval ratings and, and basically the straight shot down that, that it's been all year, um, started to hear whispers that one of the policies that they're meeting with congressional leaders about and, and, you know, tone, tone it down and dial it back is around crypto, right? Why why make any more enemies when right now things are shaping up to be uh, pretty terrible for for the Democrats as a party going into the the midterms? Why would you turn off uh, an entire base of young progressives that actually are passionate about this, right? Um, and uh, and that's my biggest fear, or it has been my biggest fear that this gets politicized and it becomes you know uh, just another political football, but. We're starting to see, I think, a slow sea change thanks to a couple of the Democratic senators and congressmen that stuck their neck out. Yeah, agreed. Yeah, I think it, I think it is going to be incredibly politically unpopular to, to quote attack crypto in some way. I mean, you're literally hurting people in their wallets who who hold it if if that's the case. But it's also just killing people's excitement about the future and all the cool things they can go build. There's kind of this, mm -hmm. you know, we're all going to make it vibe happening with NFTs right now and. Um, there's a sort of paternalistic vibe to what's happening too, which is saying, you know, hey, we're we're here to protect you, but that means, you know, if you're not an accredited investor, you can't play in this space or something. And it's, I think it's some of those rules are actually kind of outdated. We need to rethink in America and probably in other countries what it means to be an accredited investor. Like the the, the idea behind it is good. We're trying to protect people and have appropriate disclosures. Like I think everybody can get on the same page about that. Let's go get rid of the scams. Go prosecute the scams. You know, the frauds. But mm -hmm. if you're actually just preventing um, people who aren't already wealthy from getting wealthy, you know, it's paternalistic and it's 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 actually harming equality. It's one of the, it's one of the most uh, anti equality things out there. So anyway, these are complex issues. I guess let's jump over to Web3. You know, you write a lot in the report about some of your predictions for 2022. Um, you know, do you want to give a high level overview or do you want to jump into the first uh, area here that you mentioned around interoperability? Because I think that's super interesting. Yeah, I mean, well, first, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the report itself. You, you kind of tease it in your intro. Um, it's long, right? Um, 
but for the fact that there's a lot going on in the industry, right? So there, there's a reason that this takes the amount of time that it does and, and we actually prioritize it. And I do say we, because it takes me so long that it kind of distracts my focus from other parts of the Sorry business and the team picks up the slack. But, you know, one of the reasons that we put this together, it, it's not only to have our own kind of mental model for how the industry is evolving and, and what's coming around the corner. Um, it's uh, to hopefully serve as a starting point for conversations across all of our customers, all the folks that we do business with, all of our investors, and um, and no one else does it, right? So it's it's uh, it's it's really trying to kind of address what I think is a vacuum of information when it comes to like having a Mary Meeker style, um, you know, internet report. And I'm not trying to say that I'm I'm at the same same level as as Mary Meeker, but um, I do think that's an important for an emerging industry that's moving as fast as crypto is, right? So that's kind of the starting point. The other thing is this is broken down into 120 sections. So you can literally go chapter by chapter, section by section, and, and kind of digest it in bite-size increments, depending on what you're diving deep on. And I write it for myself to serve as an index, right? Um, as I'm going back to a given topic, what can I cite? What do I know from memory? And, and how do I update my assumptions over the course of the year? Um, and my hope is that other people can use it in the same way. So first half of the report is basically um, narratives, and kind of key tailwinds, people to watch, which all kind of have different themes associated with them, the regulatory update, Bitcoin and just Bitcoin, um, and then kind of market infrastructure. That's kind of first half, section one, that can be you know, very useful for institutions or, or basically like any newcomer to the space. And the second half is where we get into Web3, and that's essentially four chapters. Um, NFTs, which are obviously the probably the uh, theme of the year, the word of the year from uh, Webster's or one of the dictionaries, um, DeFi and kind of all the evolution that we've seen this year, even though it's been in a secular bear market relative to the other assets, um, then, you know, kind of the, the explosion of other layer ones and this, you know, multi-chain future that we're living in, how is that infrastructure ultimately going to be built and how do these chains communicate with each other? And then finally, how's it all governed, which, you know, really comes down to DAOs um, as, a, as an organizing primitive. So, um, I think what those four Web3 building blocks um, are, you know, each deserving of their own, you know, 20 page report. And that's, you know, more or less what we covered. But um, uh, I, I think you can't really have one without the other, because I think that's going to be the foundation for many years to come. Those uh, those four elements. That's great. Well, you cover a lot of ground in there. Do you want to start by talking a bit about the importance of interoperability between the layer ones and um, what you're seeing emerging there. What do you think that'll unlock? Mm -hmm. I think that was the biggest um, update to a lot of people's thesis uh, this year is, uh, are we going to have one winner take all like smart contract platform? Uh, and is ETH2 basically going to absorb the addressable universe of blockchain applications? And, and I think the answer is no. Um, and, and we've kind of seen that. Now, do, do we think there's going to be like 30 different competing standards? Probably not just because that would be a nightmare for developers and it's, it would be difficult, I think, to, to replicate um, all of the infrastructure that currently exists on Ethereum on, on you know, five or six even different stacks. So um, I think it really, you know, to, to, to me right now, it, it's looking like anything that's EVM compatible and then maybe um, uh, anything that can plug into you know, Polkadot, IBC and Solana um, are, are going to be the um, uh, the protocols and, and kind of the sets of infrastructure that you need to pay attention to. Um, I uh, did not think that uh, Ethereum was going to have a clear rival at the beginning of the year. I'm still not really sure, but it's no longer like 100% probability or close to it that you know Ethereum just kind of runs away with it. They still got to deal with the merge. We've got to prove that um, there's good interoperability between you know layer one and layer two and between the different layer twos. And um, and there's a lot of you know, up and coming ecosystems that are are moving faster in different respects because they're making different security trade offs. Yeah, agreed. I think it kind of all comes back to this: the power of scalability, right? And developer, the pro mm -hmm. you know, probably the largest developer community is still around ETH, and we're seeing you know DeFi and NFTs, all these kind of things that have gotten so much traction this year are all really being built on, for the most part, on ETH, not entirely, um, but. People, the, the gas fees are just so high, it's punitive and people are, it's like dial up to broadband. People are going to go where they can get traction and, and scale. And I think every time we bring the, the fees down in, by an order of magnitude, the number of applications goes up by an order of magnitude because they're sort of, 
you know, being prohibited today. In fact, you even saw with DeFi, some of like, you know, how often do you do a loan or something like that? It's relatively few transactions that are needed, but the more that you can develop these transactions where there's, you know, the average person is doing a hundred transactions a day or maybe a hundred transactions a minute, like there are various th applications that become possible in that world. Mm -hmm. So I guess, do you have a prediction on ETH2 and, you know, the layer twos um, and versus say Solana or, or the other assets that you mentioned in terms of who's going to win developer mind share and get that with that new layer of scalability. You know, I, it feels like there's a really, there's a race. There's basically a race that's on for who's going to be that dominant smart contract platform that's scaled and has the features people care mm -hmm. about, maybe like, like privacy or two other things like that. Do you have a prediction how that's going to play out in the next year? Um, I think the early returns on uh, ZK rollups uh, are very good. And and so if early teams can prove that they're able to effectively develop uh, using you know, ZK tech um, on Ethereum layer two, that to me is like the foot race. Yes, there's like other you know, projects like you know, Arbitrum and Optimism and, and, and whatnot. But I think um, how quickly you can have uh, layer one to kind of ZK rollup, um, seamless integrations and, and you know, applications that are, are, are built on those uh, chains. And then how well those different chains are, are able to communicate with each other is going to dictate whether um, more mindshare floods to you know, IBC um, and, and the Cosmos ecosystem or whether something like Solana can, can you know, really take off. And Solana is interesting you know, because they're making a fundamentally different set of trade-offs. Um, when it comes to security and, and decentralization, um, Ethereum obviously has the head start, and then you kind of have Polkadot and and you know, Cosmos lingering um, with with their layer zero type approach, um, basically you know agreeing from day one that uh, the most important thing is is that you know, different sovereign chains can talk to each other versus you know, trying to create uh, necessarily a, a master chain to rule them all. Um, I would be surprised if Ethereum loses its head start just because of how much infrastructure has already been developed and because the scalability um, solutions are coming to market and, and they are moving quickly on them. And we know that they work at least you know, for some uh, applications like DYDX and, and you know, others that have already moved L2. Um, but it, I don't think it's a foregone conclusion like uh, I think many people thought at the beginning of the year, myself included. Um, that's, that's, again, been the biggest surprise for me. All right, I'll ask one other question and then we'll go to some questions from the audience. Um, let's talk a bit about DAO infrastructure. It feels, I don't know, I don't know if you agree. I mean, if NFTs were the, the word of 2021, I kind of feel like DAOs may be the word of 2022. I'm not sure. Um, mm -hmm. And it feels like there needs to be a lot more infrastructure around DAOs. Um, you know, I think we're going to see more DAO m &A, you know, <laughs> I think we're going to see payroll needs to get done better. Like some of the, like Constitution DAO showed that some of the fundraising tools could probably be improved in certain ways. Um, people weren't really sure what percentage of the total they were going to own because just more and more money kept coming in. And um, mm -hmm. we're seeing really amazing stuff happening like with City DAO. And uh, I mean, there's just so many cool DAOs out there. Um, what do you think the industry needs for DAO infrastructure? And, you know, is there an opportunity for Coinbase to help there and build something? Or, um, yeah, what yeah. do you think is, the industry needs next? Well, first, I start with the question uh, for, for every new like crypto based product, uh, which is, you know, do people want this? Uh, is Can it work? And then can it scale, right? Those are kind of the three questions that you ask with everything. And if you look historically, typically, if you answer the first two questions in the affirmative, yes, people want this, and yes, it can work, then every time historically within crypto, that scalability challenge and like the infrastructure challenge um, has been met. And, and you've seen, you know, a slate of very valuable company services and protocols that, that you know address that kind of third bucket and, and that need. This has happened in NFTs. It's happened in DeFi. It's it's happening in transactions and stable coins. Um, I think the same is going to be true in governance. So, what do you actually like need to scale? You need a hundred x improvement in information quality and throughput, and then you ultimately need um, identity and reputation systems that allow you to delegate authority very quickly, even through a decentralized organization. So. Um, I think you know, we've seen this with you know, friends with benefits and, and some of the other you know, DAOs that are starting to adopt this um, 
pod like structure where you have different committees essentially that are um, are delegated certain authority to work on either different components of the treasury spend or the protocol developments. Um, that is going to be standardized over a multi-year period, and there's going to be a, a slate of companies that, that deliver tools related to treasury management, workforce management, payroll, um, and, uh, and and everything that goes along with actually you know, transforming companies into decentralized companies, uh, which is you know, no trivial task if you're trying to interface with the real world. Um, that's where we're excited. Um, that's where we've spent a lot of time and you know, kind of going back to why, why write this report. Um, how DeFi gets governed, um, how these layer one protocols get governed uh, is ultimately going to be dependent on DAO infrastructure. And a lot of DAO infrastructure is going to leverage non-fungible reputation tokens. Um, and I think other you know, packets of information that are, are not fungible, but rather they're earned and, and can be kind of transferred from wallet to wallet um, on a, um, uh, uh, if you're thinking about like delegated authority within some of these organizations. So um, to me, I think you're right. I, I think 2022 is going to be the year of the DAO. And, and uh, with respect to Coinbase in particular, I, I don't I don't know. I'm, I'm sure that it's such a big theme that, you know, you and, and all the other major exchanges and wallets and um, and custodians and, and kind of other infrastructure developers are, are, are going to be building tools around how these uh, protocols are, are governed. Um, the design space, though, is is so incredibly massive that um, it's just a, a good place to spend the next few years if you're a developer or your startup. Yeah, it makes sense. I mean, I think, you know, Coinbase has 73 million verified users, but it's only a tiny fraction of those are probably even using DAOs or inter interfacing with them. And so our, our whole mm -hmm. thesis as a company really is how do we make all these new developments in crypto trusted and easy to use? And then hopefully, you know, we can help tens more tens of millions more people come into it. And so I feel like we're behind. There's way more that we could be doing. You know, I wish there was a, some simple tools already there today that allowed people to just see a list of DAOs and you know participate, and they could see proposals. They could have delegated voting, like you said, and um, you know, hey, I trust this person. I'm going to delegate my my votes to them or whatever. And so that stuff could all be productized in the wallets. I think in such a, in such a better way. So lots of work to do. There's no shortage of new opportunities um, sitting in front of us here. All right, you ready to do some questions from the audience? Yes, that's All what right. I'm looking forward cool. to. Uh, what do you think is the best way to mobilize crypto holders or hodlers to influence policy in the US and elsewhere? DAOs, PACs, coordinated voting efforts. How do we get that grassroots movement going? This one's a tough one um, because I think you do need a figurehead and, um, and a leader for this. And, uh, and it, it's one of those moments in time where everybody is, is uh, just struggling to keep their head above water and scale their own companies. And, and yeah, the most likely candidates to lead something like this are probably among the group of folks that you already know, um, which would include me and, and probably include some other CEOs. And I just don't know how many of us are, are kind of willing and, and able uh, even to, uh, to kind of step up and, and lead the, the charge on this um, as kind of a dedicated effort. Um, so, uh, having said all that, I am uh, still kind of personally trying to find um, a small group uh, or, or small organization that's going to take the mantle here. And, and then you know, I'll personally throw you know, my weight behind it and, and spend a good deal of uh, time and, and effort and energy there because I think it's important. And I do think you need someone that's going to be you know, a catalyst and, and not a spokesman uh, so much, but but someone that's, that's going to hopefully um, capture that audience and, and get people to fund a winning organization so you can triage resources um, in the right direction. I think we probably need an advocacy group that has a political action committee and um, and kind of education arm associated with it. Um, so you can you can play in both uh, electoral politics uh, and, and actively engage with some of these campaigns. Um, but then also you've got a broader mandate to um, uh, educate policymakers and uh, create something like a congressional scorecard or you know other system to, to start triaging uh, who are our friends, who are our enemies, and um, and then holding them accountable when it comes time to uh, to vote every November. Agreed. Yeah. Um, I've been excited to see more and more members of Congress now hosting, participating in fundraising dinners with the crypto community. That's been happening. I don't know if it's public, mm -hmm. but behind the scenes, yep. more and more of those. There's enough people who have crypto now um, that really care about these issues. They're almost like single issue voters. And I think 
-hmm. you know, someone made this comment to me, you know, nobody in DC is really going to care until someone loses a, loses an election over it. I think that's probably true. Mm -hmm. We do need to turn out uh, more and more voters and, and allocate uh, these donations from, from the really large constituency. So we've got time for maybe just one more question here. So, all right, are Ethereum, quote, Ethereum killer centralized chains a race to the bottom in terms of who can be fastest and cheapest? Um, I think the question is kind of asking, like, is it all about scalability and lowering fees or are there ways that some of these other chains can differentiate? Honestly, I'm not sure, um, right? It, it's it's all speed, scalability, security, and, and then um, kind of censorship resistance, right? Uh, and, and preventing deplatforming. So it, it is a combination, but I think the the real pain point is around um, uh, speed and, and costs, uh, which is where you know a chain like Solana has has been able to really come up the the ranks and um, and you know, eat into Ethereum's dominance. And the reason for that, I mean, it, it's it's relatively straightforward. I mean, we were we've been testing our governor product and um and you have to you have to rack up thousands of dollars uh just during the, the testing uh phase for um uh not a lot of transactions. So you, you kind of extrapolate that to the startup in the in the garage or or that's kind of run out of a dorm room and it's just not feasible. You have to find another stack to build on top of. Um, and I think that's okay, uh, as kind of a temporary bottleneck, but the longer it persists, um, the more likely it is that we see developers and, and, you know, kind of whole swaths of infrastructure make the, the trade-off and, and kind of accept that, you know what, um, yes, this is a little bit more centralized, but the other chain is unusable or, or the other, you know, kind of tech stack is unusable. Um, this happened to a, a lesser extent with Bitcoin. Bitcoin was never as robust uh, as, as Ethereum. It was never designed to be a Turing complete computer. Um, but uh, I, I think you know, we saw this play out in real time. And, and, and I don't know about you, Brian, but I, for, for a long time, I thought that um, Ethereum will be the smart contract programming language, but ultimately you'll be able to port Bitcoin to it. And Bitcoin will still be like the settlement currency in the reserve. Um, and that was disproven. And I think the same thing is happening now from layer one to layer one, and, and it will continue to happen over time for the medium yeah. term, at least. Yeah, well, I think you're right. The race is on and 22, 2022 will be an interesting year to see who can achieve scalability and that developer mindshare um, to build the next generation of apps. And that that's going to bring in the next billion people into crypto. So it'll be very exciting to see. Well, Ryan, we're out of time. I want to thank you very so much for coming and spending the time with us. Uh, thank you for being a champion for the industry and um, providing so much great research and insights into what people can see coming up in 2022 in crypto. Today's conversation is for informational purposes only and does not constitute legal or investment advice. Actual results may vary materially from any forward-looking statements made and are subject to risks and uncertainties. 